But as I guess you all know, we'll be moving next week, so I took this opportunity to not only have given the first girls <laughs> center seminar lecture in the Yosefino, but also the last. Uh, it's been 20 years, so that's quite a number of lectures. How you all, you're all fairly new, yeah? And young, I mean, Martin, of course, knows <laughs> the very beginning, but it's hard to believe that it's 20 years since. Um, we started this. Oh, really? <laughs> With Professor Christian. Oh, God. All right. So Martin just trumped me <laughs> with his experience. Good. Uh, I don't want to hold up the party, so I'm going to try to give uh, uh, a brief lecture. Let's get right to the point. You came here to, to see Mighty Mouse, right? That's why you're here. So Ricard will kindly reveal to you what Mighty Mouse looks like. That's Mighty Mouse, okay. I don't know much about the cartoon character. I, I know a fair amount yet, to, yet now about the mathematical <laughs> version. But I should know, uh, point out that Mighty Mouse, first of all, Mighty Mouse is a girl. You know? At least that's my opinion, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, and secondly, uh, okay, who knows who, knows who Superman is? Was. Does anybody know who Superman? Superman? Superman. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Superman could uh, what leap? What was the verb? The leap tall buildings in a single bound. But that's when he was wearing his silly costume, right? Which I wore every single Halloween as a child. Uh, but what was okay? Everyone except Martin. Martin's so well informed. What was Superman when he was not Superman? When he was, you know, on a normal day, what was Superman? Clark Kent, yes, an unassuming reporter for a major metropolitan newspaper. <laughs> okay, I am not Mighty Mouse, so I want to make it clear. This is Mighty Mouse, but I just wanted to point out that during the day, Mighty Mouse doesn't look like that. She looks like this. Okay, so this is Mighty Mouse, uh, unassuming. This is during the day. She's um, Molly Mouse. Okay. And then when some major event occurs, for example, she has to force the universe to be generic over one of her iterates, she puts on this costume and then she soars into space in order to fly around the stable core and create a forcing extension. Okay, so before I get to all that, I wanna tell you where this, is all, where this all started with a rather seemingly naive question that I was asking a while ago uh, what is, what happens if you construct from the cardinals? I mean, uh, this is actually one special case of a range of questions. You take some natural definable predicate cardinals, the cofinality function, uh, the regularity predicate, you know, something that kind of looks you exponential function. You look at some natural predicate like that. And you say, well, what information can you read off from this? Now, let me give it away. You can't read off too much. This is a club. And okay, it has a little bit of information coded into it. For those who know about zero sharp, you can find zero sharp in there. You can find a little bit more, but you're not gonna find too much in L card. Uh, well, the answer, roughly speaking, is that you can capture L card uh, with Minnie Mouse. That's what do I call her? Mighty Mouse with Minnie Mouse. Okay. So I have to tell you what Minnie Mouse is. That is, um, there's this idea here that actually natural predicates such as card can be captured. I'll say you'll tell you what that means by iterating small structures with large cardinal properties. Okay, so let me tell you what it means to capture. Capture means, i.e., L card is an inner model. of an iterate 
of Minnie Mouse. I know I misspelled Minnie Mouse, but I like to put a Y at the end of names like mine <laughs> okay, instead of IE. <laughs> All right. So let me, the idea here is very, very simple, and this is sort of the beginning of a, you know, this is going to lead us eventually to Mighty Mouse. Uh, so surprisingly, in fact, one can go further, and actually Philip Welsh recently wrote a paper where he uh, exhibited all the fine points. You can say exactly what this model is. It's a generic extension of an iterate of Mini Mouse. That's all it is. I mean, I'm assuming, you know, be generous with me, V is not L, okay, please, otherwise this is L. <laughs> Uh, you know, let's assume that, you know, she exists. <laughs> okay. Good. All right, so let me be a little more mathematical. In fact, a lot more mathematical since there's essentially nothing mathematical there. Um, yeah, so this is going to be a class iteration because to catch this class, we're going to have to. And what typically is going to happen here is slightly embarrassing. You're going to iterate ORD many times. And what you're going to get is something taller than the ordinals. And then you're going to just chop its head off. You're going to cut it at ord. Let me illustrate it with, uh, with, with this example. Because this is the prototypical example. And uh, there are many, well, there are several results of this type and many more yet to be proved. Right, Viney? I like her. She looks nice. OK, so what is Minnie Mouse? Minnie Mouse. Mini M, this is the least iterable mouse <laughs> with a measurable limit of measurable cardinals. I mean, by modern standards, this is nothing at all. This is very, very, very small. Uh, forgive me, those of you who don't work with large cardinals, but in the large cardinal context, this is, this is very, very small. Measurable limit of measurables. Actually, I'm going to call, well, maybe I'm going to use this definition later, so let me give it now. So zero measurable is measurable, and then m plus one measurable is measurable limit of n measurables. So one measurable is a measurable limit of measurable, then you have measurable limits of measurable limits of measurables, et cetera. Okay, so I'm gonna use that later. So here's the picture, and this is going to prove this, provide this answer here. So here's Minnie Mouse. Okay, I guess, has a tail, whiskers, okay. And here's the measurable limit of measurables. So this is the top measurable cardinal of Minnie Mouse. And these are measurables approaching it, okay. And it's the least mouse like this, okay. So I mean, there are other mice with measurable limits of measurables, but I want the smallest one, okay? Yeah, yeah, it can't be measure one. <laughs> it has to be unbounded, though. It has to be unbounded. Okay. All right. So, uh, I'm sorry I draw her so big, but um, I'll try to, okay. And here... Here is our model L card. Okay, and so here are the cardinals. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I have to erase it. See, Minnie Mouse is countable. Even Mighty Mouse is countable. Right? And here we're talking about cardinals, so like all of one. Okay. So if you would allow me, this is not an eraser. Is it? Just, not to erase it. Okay. Just use the the local eraser here, okay? So, you know, here's all of one. I'll write it as omega one. I don't know what happened. I used to say all of one, now I say omega. Is there any convention on this? I think this is the ordinal and all of one is the cardinal, but nobody <laughs> makes that distinction. Except when you get to all of omega, you can't write omega omega, it looks stupid. 
Okay, good. And here's our little baby. Here's our baby mini mouse with her kappa and her measurable cardinals. Better draw a little bit more clearly. There's the least measurable, there's the second measurable, and then there are more measurables converging to kappa. Uh, Okay, can you guess what's going to happen? <laughs> I think you can. <laughs> Which is, I'm going to iterate her. Okay, and how am I going to iterate her? I'm kind of assuming you know what I mean by iterate. By iterate, I mean you take an, an ultra power by these measures. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit that first measure again and again and again and again and again and again, and again, and again all of one times. Okay, and then after having done that, I'm going to, you know, this picture is not so good, but after that, I'm going to then hit the second measure all of two times, starting not from the beginning. That's why the picture is wrong. Starting from there. Yeah, starting from the first iterate. <laughs> That's why I should. So I iterate omega one times. I'm not done. I stop. And then I iterate omega two times with the next measure, and then omega three times with the next measure. These are my, this is a mouse. So mouse means you can iterate you know, any way you want, and it'll stay well-founded. You won't lose a well-founded model. Okay. Yeah, I should probably make a better picture. So how do we do it? How do we make a good picture here? Yeah, that's right. So this arrow, I mean, it's getting taller. This is going omega one times. All right, omega one times. And what's happening, yeah, here's omega one, here's omega one. Oh, the arrow's <laughs> pointing in the wrong direction. <laughs> this is going to go up to, is that better? <laughs> I did it, All right. I've never done this before. Okay, and then, as Martin said, you start here, right? This is, there's still a second measurable here. Actually, the second measurable only has size omega one, and we're trying to make it up to omega two, which is up here. Okay. So then we iterate again. How am I doing, David? Not bad? And notice, I mean, when you do this, you don't move what's below. So when you iterate, when you hit a, a measure, you just have the identity map on, on the ordinals below it. Okay. But now you get the real omega-2, right? Omega yeah, this is meant to be the real omega-2. Yeah. And we continue having fun this way, right? I mean, what we do, I have to be careful what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do is, well, let me just tell you the conclusion. <laughs> We iterate the measurables onto the successor cardinals. So the least measurable goes to alpha one. The second measurable goes to omega two. The omega measurable, which is not the limit of the first omega measurables, right? Because that's a singular cardinal, is going to go to Aleph omega plus one, okay? So it's pretty clear that you can do this in ord steps so that in the end, if you iterate, what you're gonna get, you know, long dot, 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 what you're going to get is you're going to get a mouse, uh, not enough space, this wasn't well planned. You're gonna get something, what? It's gonna have height bigger than the ordinals, right? Because because kappa, kappa is getting pushed to ord. Here's ord. But it's not clear that kappa gets pushed to ord, is it? Is that, I, mean, I have to check it. Like, you mean you're worried that it's pushed higher than ord, but it will be pushed exactly to ord. But it's pushed at least to ord because things below it are getting pushed higher and higher and higher. So each model in the first, in the, I mean, in the, after the first iteration, you have already added one many uh, uh, measurables. 
We, we, we always have kappa many, whatever kappa is, yeah. So, so kappa has moved, yes. Kappa has moved to cardinal of by foot. Yeah. But in the, in the model, there are going to be kappa many measurables. And so you're right, they're going to be uncountably many. So actually, you are giving birth to new measurable cardinals. <laughs> you have to, because you only have countably many, and you better end up with class many. So as you go, you kind of generate some new measurables. And as was pointed out, this top measurable, which actually um, I'm kind of waving my hands over detail. You're going to have to hit the top measurable, otherwise you're going to get stuck. Yeah. See, what's going to you're going to have to, what's going to happen is after a, cer a certain point, you've already run through all the measurables below kappa. Then you're stuck unless you hit kappa. Then so then you want to hit kappa to do what you said to to give rise to a whole new pile of measurable cardinals. And then, it, then you hit those, and then you keep going until you get these kind of closure points, where uh, after a certain number of steps, kappa is the least measurable that you haven't hit yet. So that you better hit that. So kappa will be hit. But then in that model, there's only one measurable. No. Be no, no. Kappa is the top measurable. And then you take the ultra power, and now you've given birth to kappa many but new measurables. Many, many it's a limit of measurables. Kappa stays in limit of measurables. Elementary. It's elementary. But I'm saying at some point you get to an iterate that's so, you've iterated so long now that every measurable below the current kappa has already kind of been hit, if you know what I mean. It's already. So then what you do is you hit kappa, and then that starts the whole game over again. You need that top measurable. Okay. It sounds like you're saying at some stage kappa is both the why does the least measurable and that's Not the least measurable, measurable, no. The measurable stays below. Really the measurable stay, stay below, yeah. Oh, that's they don't the change. They, they freeze, yeah. yeah. And the problem is not to move it anymore, yeah. otherwise you... you no, the, the true omega-1 is the least measurable right. and oh, stays okay. the least yeah. measurable. Then the true oh, so omega-2... Yeah. And then you want to collapse everything in between. Right? There's no collapsing. You just yeah. keep iterating. I mean, if sub... If you like... If some measurable of your current mouse is not sitting at a successor cardinal, you better kick it. Okay. <laughs> Until eventually you're going to have to kick the top measurable, which is fine. And then you're going to kick it, you know, to the next true V cardinal, the successor cardinal, the next cardinal of V. Okay. So in the end, kappa is going to make it, you know, kappa is going to land at ORD. And so the iterate, let's call it mini m infinity equals the ORD iterate is a mouse of height, well, it's going to be of height greater than ORD. But ORD will be the top measurable. Now, of course, we're not really interested with, about what's happening at ORD and above, right? I mean, we were trying to get L card, and this model stops at ORD. There's nothing above the ORD. So then we just simply take a sharp knife and then cut, cut the head off of this mouse, right? So you take this, finally, this needs better graphics. So this mini M infinity restricted to ORD. Okay, now look at this model. I mean, what is nice about an iterate is that you're not changing the first order theory, right? These are elementary embeddings, right? At least from, you know, the V kappas, you know? And, you know, in terms of large cardinals, they all have the same kind of large cardinals in them. So this is a... This is a nice model. It's what we call a fine structural model, sort of L-like. Okay. The mouse is just kappa. You say the mouse is the ZFC model, or is kappa the largest cardinal? This, yeah, this will be a ZFC model. Kappa is inaccessible before you cut. The one you start out with. Yes. Oh no, no. This is this is like a sharp. So it's a. Kappa is the largest cardinal. Yeah, kappa is the largest cardinal. Yeah. You can think of this as a model of ZFC minus power.
feel like. Like zero sharp, you think of as um, L kappa plus, or together with a predicate on, on the largest cardinal. Okay. Now, what is interesting about this? What are the measurable cardinals here? They're the successor cardinals of V. So, have I done what I promised? I said L card should be an inner model of the iterate. Well, if I know what the successor cardinals then are, then in Lubomir's course, I guess you haven't taught it for a while. You learn that you can define the cardinals from the successor cardinals. You take the closure. All right. In Vera's course. It's whoever's teaching set theory now. Okay. So that's how you capture the cardinals. So this model is an inner model of an iterate of a small mouse. So you know something, for example, this mouse itself, just by abstract theory, this, con this real, think of this as a real number, it really is, is not in this model. This model doesn't have much in it. It doesn't even have this little mouse in it. It's a fairly skinny model. It will have zero sharp in it, but it won't have, it won't have this mouse in it. Okay, so then you may ask me, um, okay, we've captured it. Maybe I should make some general definitions. So a mouse, and I'm going to be vague about what a mouse is. Just think of it as um, an iterable structure built from large cardinals with a nice hierarchy on it. A mouse M captures a predicate P. P should be something nice like the cardinality predicate, the cofinality predicate, or the regularity predicate, or something. Uh, if um, L of P, or let's say P is definable over an iterate of M. But we might want more. We say um, a mouse. Uh, captures, maybe exactly captures, let's say characterizes P. <laughs> if L of P is a generic extension, is, literally, is a generic extension of an iterate well, so it turns out, I mean, it's not too hard. You, see, you need a lemma due to Gunther Fuchs, actually. It was from his PhD. Um, with, this, with Fuchs's lemma, you can actually modify this now. And I'll tell you exactly what L card is. Not, not what it's an inner model of, but exactly what L card is. OK. So uh, to characterize card. That is, I want to tell you exactly what L card is. I'm going to exhibit it as a generic extension of an iterate of a mouse, actually an iterate of this mouse. Do the same, except iterate the measurables uh, below kappa, the flow below the top measurable onto not the successor cardinals, onto, you know already? Did you guess it already? The successor limit cardinals. <laughs> In other words, um, enumerate the limit cardinals and take the successor points of the enumeration of the limit cardinals. So what do you have? You have alpha omega, alpha omega plus omega, but you're not going to have alpha omega squared. You're going to have alpha omega squared plus omega, et cetera. Okay. All right. And just waving my hands a bit, what's going to happen now? Here's ord. So here is alpha omega. What's the next successor limit? Alpha omega plus omega alpha omega squared, fine, but then alpha 
omega squared plus omega. When you do this iterate, so for example, the least measurable, I'll call it kappa zero. That's the least measurable in Minnie Mouse. Is getting iterated up to Aleph Omega. Now, due to work of Prickery and Matthias, you can figure out the following. If you do that, then of course when kappa zero goes up to Aleph Omega, it's going through Aleph one, Aleph two, Aleph three, etc. What's going to happen is is that the Aleph ends this omega sequence. This is omega is a Prickery sequence. <laughs> for the measure. Remember, when you do this, you end up with this cardinal of V being measurable in the iterate. Of course, it's singular in V, but in the iterate, it's a measurable cardinal. The measure on alpha omega. Uh, that's because Matthias showed that being prickery generic for a measure just means that uh, the ta that you induce the tail filter, that, it, that a set is in the measure if and only if it contains a tail of the sequence. Right? So for this sequence to be prickery just means that every set of measure one contains a tail of it. And that's true because of the nature of this iteration. Okay, some technicalities I'm waving over. Okay, and that's gonna be true here too, that the Aleph omega plus one, Aleph omega plus two, et cetera, this sequence, this is prickery as well for the measure here. All right, I mentioned Gunther Fuchs. <laughs> this only proves that what you're getting is you're getting the iterate together with a bunch of prickery sequences. That's what you're getting. You know, if you want to infer L card from this. But what you'd like to say is that you have a generic extension, that these prickery sequences are somehow jointly generic. For, yeah, it's actually product, yeah. It's an ord size product of prickery forcing. So you have to check, and this I think this helps, uh, what, what Gunther did helps to prove that actually if you look at these prickery sequence, they're, they're not just individually generic, but as a, as a class sequence, they're generic for a class prickery forcing, for a class product of prickery forcings. Okay, so what you're getting then is that L card, Again, I mean, if you know the successor limit cardinals and you know these prickery sequences, you know all the limit, you know all the cardinals. So L card is just going to be, I don't know, this iterate, I'll just call it M star, or maybe mini, mini mouse star. This is a different star, right? This is a different iterate than that one. Um, together with a um, prickery product generic, prickery, product generic and that's ex that's inequality I'm also waving my hands a bit here well how do you know that the cardinals can figure out what these measures are well essentially the measures are the tail filters given by the prickery sequences you have to argue it a bit so then this will contain the measures obviously it contains the prickery sequences because those are just the cardinals but then conversely, of course, this, you just look at these prickery sequences that tells you what the cardinals are. So that's a very nice result, I think. It, um, yeah, you started with a naive question, you know, probably your students in set theory one ask, what happens if I construct from the cardinals? <laughs> what do I get? And the answer is this. And notice this didn't depend much on V, on the real universe. I just needed to know that Minnie Mouse exists. God forbid Minnie Mouse doesn't exist. Okay. In your iteration, you always map the, uh, the, the measurable to the measure. Yeah. But you, you could have some choice. For example, you wanted to, to code some real, and you want to keep some real from the beginning. Yes. And you could say, I don't go to the next. I go to, after that. I just hit the olive ends for certain ends. For certain ends. Yes, you could do this. And then you would get a model with, with some pre striped Mm, but then if you construct from that sequence of all of ends, that doesn't mean you can figure out what that set of ends was. 
Notice, in fact, the following turns out to be the case. This is actually the same as L of C for any club contained in the cardinals. Any club at all. So you can fit it out any way you want, and you're going to get the same model. But you can't recover. If you had the pair, then you could sort of see how they interact, but you, you don't. And that actually leads to the next thing I was going to mention, because this is kind of step one. Um, I'm kind of leading you in, in baby footsteps toward the stable core, toward the stability predicate. The stability predicate has more than just the cardinals in it. It also has what you call the stable cardinals. So that is kind of hinted at by Martin's question. Suppose we want to do more. We want to capture two clubs, a club C1, and that we've captured here, you know, a club C1 contained in the cardinal. And we want to capture a subclub, a thinner club. We'll capture the pair. I had heard of Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse, but I had never heard of Mighty Mouse. I thought I invented a new notion, but I, I uh, Googled it. Obviously, there is a Mighty Mouse. Is anyone familiar with it? Apparently, it's a cartoon character, Mighty Mouse. But it's not related to Mickey Mouse. It's not Disney, it's seen. And it's, well, it's kind of threatening to Mickey, huh? Kind of a competitor <laughs> for Mickey. What? At the time, women were not, well, Wonder Woman was a superhero. Yeah. Well, look, I declared Mighty Mouse to be I mean, no, let me put a girl. At this time, <laughs> women would have long eyelashes. <laughs> I see. Uh -huh. Okay. I insist. Um, must be my... Well, let's say she was a man at birth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so let me ask you this question. This is a little too naive, but we can play with it. Suppose C1 contains C2. Now we have two guys, and these are clubs. In fact, I want to say clubs of cardinals. This is a little too naive. What is L of C1, C2? And then you run into the difficulty that Martin mentioned. I mean, maybe, you know, this is a problem. I mean, if <laughs> C2 is just C1 with some of the omega n's deleted, Right, then you can code in, right? Then, you know, together, then this contains the set, the arbitrary set of deleted ends. In other words, what I'm just saying is that you can code any real into this at all. We can't expect this to be somehow nicely characterized as a generic extension of a mouse iterate uh, in general. But I don't want to look at just any pair like that. I mean, of course, if C1 equals C2, we, know, we already know what's, what's happening. So what do we want to say? We want to say somehow that C2 sits very nicely in C1. And let me, let me give you an example, and this is the kind of example we're leaning for, leaning towards. This is what uh, sort of the beginnings of the stable core, the stability predicate. Maybe C1 is a card as before, 
but C2 equals the sigma 1 stables relative to, to card. So what does that mean? These are the alphas such that H alpha with card is sigma 1 elementary in V with card. So this is somehow a very thin but uniform club. This is a club. Right. We can go further. C3 we could take to be the sigma 2 stables, etc. Right. Okay. So in this case, so it's not clear how you would code. I mean, the C2 somehow is very, um, very uniform and reflective relative to C1. It's not clear how you would code information into the pair C1 and C2. Okay, well, here's what's bigger than mini. There's Medi, <laughs> Medi Mouse, making this up as I go. Least mouse, med for medium. Uh, least mouse with a two measurable. So what does she look like? Of course, she also has her top kappa. Kappa is going to be a limit of one measurables. And then they're going to be these one measurables, which by definition are limits of measurables. And they're going to be zero measurables, which are measurable non-limits of measurables. Okay. Anyway, this is the least mouse with a two measurable. So the idea, and this is where things get interesting. Well, the first part isn't any surprise. I claim you can capture this L of C1, C2. You can capture it by iterating Medimouse, you know, and cutting its head off at the end. You iterate it ORD many times, and then you cut it at ORD. How are you going to do it? What we're going to do is iterate. I didn't say characterize yet. That gets interesting. Iterate the two measurables onto the successor points of C2 and the one measurables. <laughs> sorry, the one measurables. There's only one two measurable. The one measurables onto the successor points of C2 and the zero measurables, which are not one measurable, onto the successor points of C1. You better do this one. You want to do this one first. So you take the one measurables, the measurable limits, and you iterate those up onto the successor points of C2, just like before. Okay. And once you've done that, now you move up the zero measurables onto the successor points of C1. The point is the second iteration won't move the points in C2 because these points are stable. They're so stable that this iteration involving C1 below doesn't move, won't move them. They're closed under those, that iteration. That's the key thing. I mean, you have to use something here. So we want, so C1 can be any club if you like, but C2 should be a club, any club containing card. C2 should be any club uh, consisting of stable, sigma 1 stables relative to C1, okay? All right, now if you succeed in doing that, what have you got? Well, if you look at the iterate then, you can say, well, what are the one measurables and what are the zero measurables in the iterate? The one measurables will tell you what the successor points of C2 are, and therefore will tell you what C2 is, it's just the closure. And the zero measurables will tell you the successor points of C1, and therefore will tell you what C1 is. Okay, so that's how you capture this pair. Notice there's something a bit funny about going in the reverse order, but that's okay. Uh, but what if you want to 
go further, you want to say, well, what is this model? I mean, I've captured it. It's an inner model of a mouse iterate. But what is it? Can you use forcing? And as you may expect, yes. I'm going to tell you what L of C1, C2 is now. Of course, as before, we want to change this. We want to iterate to the successor limit points of C2 so that we generate prickery sequences. And to the successors, successor limit points of C1, so we also generate prickery sequences. And then we have to somehow throw all these prickery sequences together and claim that we get the whole model in that way. Well, there is an open question here. I'll tell you how far I got with this. I'm working with Sandra. Um, Sandra Mueller and Vika Gittman on this. So it's part of our joint paper on various questions associated with the stable core. So here's the current status. Here's what the model is. L of C1, C2. is obtained as follows. And I find this interesting, although, as I say, there's an open question as to whether it really has to be this complicated. First of all, you iterate MediMouse uh, sending the one measurables not onto the successor points, but onto the successor limit points. Okay, as advertised, you know, and then truncate at ord. Okay, fine. Then what's going to happen? So, um, yeah, C. Two is product prickery generic. Over this iterate, let me call the iterate M star. Okay, so we iterated our mouse. Actually, I, I prefer to call it M2 instead of many mouse. M2, it got iterated up to some, I'll call it little m star. And then it got truncated. And that's my m star. And what happens is then that C2 is generic by product prickery forcing over m star. But now something funny happens. And the next move is we haven't gotten the C1 yet, but the point is we now iterate M star of C2. All right, this is a prickery extension of an iterate. And in here you have lots of measurable cardinals. You have all the zero measurables that you, you know, through this iteration you of course have lots of zero measurables, and they're kind of sitting between points in C2. The prickery sequences don't hurt those, okay. You iterate this, sending the zero measurables onto the successors of the limit points of C1. So now what's going to happen is that M star of C2 followed by C1, sorry, M star of C2 gets iterated to something I'll call M of whatever C2 goes to. But again, C2 is, is fixed. This iteration where you're moving the onto points in C1 doesn't move the points in C2 because the points in C2 are very stable. So I can put C2 here. So that's what the iterate looks like. Okay. But then <laughs> C1, ooh, dangerous. C1 
is product prickery generic over M of C2. So the answer is, and this isn't quite the answer you may have hoped for, L of C1C2, this is this M of C2, that's a prickery extension, followed by C1 and product prickery. This is another product prickery. So it's a two-step product prickery extension of M. But there's only one problem here. And uh, I, I rather like this, but this is where Vika almost said, well, we shouldn't publish this. This isn't any good. <laughs> what, what, is, what do you see is wrong here? What is this M here? This M is gotten by iterating this iterative many mouse, but this iteration uses C2, right? This iteration is taking place in a larger model. So the question is, here's the question, is M an iterate of many mouse, of many mouse? I mean, we iterated many mouse to get up to M star. But we didn't get M by iterating M star. We got M by iterating this fatter model and then seeing what it does to M star. <laughs> now, I have no idea, unfortunately. Well, I only thought about it for two days, but still, I suspect I'll never know <laughs> um, whether this is an iterative M star. I suspect it isn't. So what is the answer is, this is a prickery extension of an iterate of a prickery extension of an iterate. And it's in the reverse direction. It's a prickery extension of an iterate of a prickery extension by the stronger measures of an iterate. So I don't know, so that's the open question. Is this actually just a generic extension of an iterate of MediMouse? It doesn't look like it. It looks like it's a generic extension of an iterate of a generic extension of an iterate. And I strongly, my feeling is that that's, that's the best you can do. But I don't know. There's this embedding from M star to M. I don't see why that should be an iteration map. It's induced by an iteration of a larger model but when you restrict an iteration to an inner model, it may not be an iteration anymore. I mean, there are theorems due to Jensen and Steele and fancy people that say that embeddings of the core model are always iteration maps. But unfortunately, this is not, <laughs> this is not the core model in the universe where this iteration takes place. This iteration needs C1, and I don't know, I mean, M star is the core model of this structure. But if you add C1, it may not be the core model anymore. So I don't know. Anyway, I like this, I like this answer. So the answer is it's a, a forcing extension of an iterate of a forcing extension of an iterate. That's, that's what this model is. And those forcings are prickery products. And that's what this. So if you want to do this n times, you do the same thing. But you have to go backwards. Or you first move Cn up. You first move up to Cn, then up to Cn minus 1 all the way down. So you get a forcing extension of an iterative, a forcing extension of an iterative, a forcing extension of an iterative, n times. And I don't know what happens if you have omega many clubs. No idea. OK. <laughs> you have to go. Exactly. So where do you start if you have omega many clubs? Um, there's probably an answer to that, but I'm not sure what it is. OK. So that's kind of at the lower end. You know, if you're looking, with the, looking at these small models, I mean, the mice here are all uh, fairly honest, mini and midi. But now we come to mighty. And why do we need mighty? It's because we want to capture, so let's stand back a moment. What do we actually want to capture with this? We want a mouse that captures a really big, a really big, strong, definable predicate. Not just the cardinals, or not just the cardinals and the sigma n stables for various n's. 
But we wanted to capture something impressive. Well, there is something very natural and very powerful. It's called the stability predicate. So the question is, well, first of all, why is the stability predicate interesting? And secondly, can we capture it? Okay, so let me make a definition. Let's say alpha is zero stable in beta. Is the, okay, if alpha is less than beta are Beth numbers, it's convenient for them to be Beth numbers because I want limits of them to be strong limits. A Beth number means two to the omega, two to the two to the omega, two, you know, you iterate the, the two to the alpha and you look at the cardinals you get. If GCH holds, these are actually just the infinite cardinals. Okay, good. And alpha is n plus one sta uh, stable in beta if um, uh, beta is a limit of n stables in beta of, of cardinals which are n stable in beta and you have elementarity here and h alpha together with the n stables in beta is sigma one elementary in h beta. Uh, sorry, the n stables in beta intersect alpha in the n stables in beta. Or if you like, equivalently, h alpha is sigma n plus one um, elementary in h beta. These are going to end up being the same. I wanted to write it this way to suggest you're talking about sigma one stability or elementarity relative to the previous class. But this is cleaner. Just so it's okay. So let's use that one. N plus one stable means that the, the larger guy is a limit of n stables, which is going to imply the smaller guy is two. <laughs> um, and you have sigma n plus one elementary. Okay. So that's also a set theory one definition. Okay, and that's the stability predicate. S is all triples and alpha beta such an alpha is n stable in beta. Okay, I had two questions. First question is, why is this interesting? <laughs> it's interesting because of this theorem. V is generic over S, that is over L of S, with S as a predicate. In fact, V is generic, more generally, V is generic over M S for any inner model such that M S is amenable. Okay, let's say such that M S satisfies head of C, if you like. In other words, yeah, S is a predicate. So it's amenable meaning the, the proper initial segments of S belong to M. S restricted to alpha is an M for all alpha. That's really what you want. I mean, I throw it said ZFC relative to S. That's another way of saying it. Okay. Good. All right. So that's why this is a, this is interesting. This is a nice predicate. I mean, capturing this is capturing a lot. I mean, you sort of think of V as this kind of cloud <laughs> surrounding the stable core. This is called the stable core. All right. So if you want to capture V in a sense, all you have to do is capture the stable core because V will just be some generic extension. 
So can we capture the stable core? Or let me just say it vaguely, because I finally will have to tell you who Minnie Mouse is. Uh, Mighty Mouse is. Um, Mighty Mouse, whoever she is, captures S. In other words, S is definable over an iterant of Mighty Mouse. I hesitate to go further. I guess you would want to know what is this model? It's a generic extension of an iterant of Mighty Mouse. I don't know. But for now, the point is Mighty Mouse, you know, when she puts on her special costume and starts flying through the air, that is iterating, she's able to create the structure that uh, trumps the, st the stable core, that has this, defines the stability predicate. And once she does that, then she knows that V is just a generic extension. So uh, philosophers, I mean, once I tell them about this, they're gonna go nuts because it has all the sorts of philosophical V meanings. What is set theory? <laughs> set theory is just iteration and forcing. But it looks a little bit hard to believe because Mighty Mouse, I mean, Mighty Mouse is mighty, so she's not so small, but she's pretty small compared to what you would think. See, a wooden cardinal is like a hurricane compared to, you know, as a monster is King Kong compared to Mighty Mouse. Mighty Mouse is just a mousy. A wooden cardinal or even, um, a, you know, even a little mouse with a wooden cardinal is much, 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 much stronger than this. So this is like a little mouse, it's a pop two singleton. But if you iterate it, you get to the point where you can force V. So I don't know, you start to wonder, maybe V isn't all it's cracked up to be. <laughs> Just learn iteration theory and forcing and you know what V is. Okay, this is a lie. All right, we can talk about this later, but the point is there are two hidden variables here, not to be physical about it. But. This iteration, when you say captures, that means you can iterate it to make S definable. This iteration is a pretty wild thing. That is, Mighty Mouse, I mean, she doesn't know how to iterate. She has to keep asking V, what do I do next? <laughs> you know, which of my extenders do I hit next? So somehow this iteration is coding a lot of information into it. But it's not too bad, because remember, the iterate is elementarily equivalent to Mighty Mouse. So the iterate doesn't have, you know, Mighty Mouse is an element. You know, it doesn't have wooden cardinals in it. This has no wooden cardinals in it. Once I tell you what it is, you'll see that. Okay. And then the other thing that's a bit mysterious is this. So V is generic over the stable core. What is the forcing? Well, I hate to disappoint you. It's not a forcing that you know. It's a forcing where the conditions are just statements of logic. Right, so a condition is just kind of an assertion. And then the generic is just generically picking what's true. So it's a little bit, you know, disturbing. I mean, I don't want to um, shoot holes in my big claim here. My claim is B is just a generic extension of an iterate of a small mouse. That's nice, and I should just shut up then. But if I were honest, and I have this tendency, right? Maxwell and I are from Chicago, and you know, people who grew up in Chicago, they're really honest and nice people, right? So we can't hide anything. So let me reveal the fact that the iteration here is very complex, right? It's very external to the mouse. You need V to tell you how to iterate this thing. And then this forcing here, what is the generic? Well, again, the generic is kind of saying, well, the generic is, tells you what's true in V, <laughs> essentially. Nevertheless, there's something striking going on here. In the previous iteration, you also needed some information from V, like what is the well, what are the card, what, what am, am I aiming for? Well, of course, here, S, is very explicit. S, is, S is also explicitly defined in V, right? This is elementary, this is the real H beta, the real H alpha of V, you know? Yes, but um, you're right, yeah. You, you, of course, you need V to know where, to, where you want to end up. But more than that, somehow you don't kind of lin linearly get there. Before we just kind of linearly got there, we just kept, here we have to kind of like what we use for called iteration trees, where you constantly change your mind about which model to hit next in the iteration. <laughs> 
And those decisions are very complicated. Okay, I'm not sure what it says. I'll, I'll let Neil Barton answer this question, but maybe it says that forcing is really too vague a notion, I mean, generic. And the point is there are forcings that you don't really understand. They're very abstractly defined. So to be generic for them doesn't tell you very much. That's probably what's going on. I mean, you can also blame the iteration, but I, I tend to blame the, the, the forcing here. You don't know much about that forcing. It's highly inhomogeneous. Okay, so I, you know, she's been waiting to be introduced. Let me tell you what Minnie Mouse is. Who Minnie Mouse is? Mighty, thank you, I keep doing that. Mighty Mouse is. Uh, I don't think of it as a very impressive mouse, but um, it does have this ability to iterate up to the stable core. It's not too hard a definition, actually. It's kind of analogous to the stability definition, but I'm going to use what are called the strong cardinals. So alpha is, let's just do it in V. Okay, so alpha is zero strong. And, uh, If I'll just say something simple, if alpha is a Beth number, nothing, too, nothing much here. Okay, but the point is this. Um, all right, let me do one strong, and then I'll do the general. Alpha is one strong. If for every gamma. There is an elementary embedding, J, from the universe to M. This is how you witness many large cardinal properties. With critical point alpha, alpha is the first ordinal move by the embedding, such that uh, V gamma, I, I like using H, just let's say H gamma is contained in M. Oh, maybe I want to say, all right, if you prefer, if you like, say J of alpha is bigger than gamma. Gamma less than J of alpha. Um, yeah. Okay, this is the usual notion of strong cardinal. It means, I mean, measurable means this, you're at the critical point of a non-trivial embedding like this. By the way, this should not be the identity. Yeah, there's a critical point, okay. Uh, St Strong says that you can get these embeddings where M is as close to V as you like, meaning any segment of V, you could write V gamma here if you prefer, uh, can be put into the target model M, that's a strong cardinal. Okay, how do you iterate strength then? So alpha is N plus one strong. If for every gamma there is an elementary embedding J, V to M, with critical point, with critical point alpha, such that 
H gamma is contained in M. So far, I haven't said anything new. Uh, yeah, so, so I should probably change this. What I want is I want the embedding to be relative to the n-strongs. So V with a predicate for the n-strongs. Yeah, so this is rather sloppily done. What I have in mind here is that you make this definition if the n-strongs are cofinal in the ordinals. So let's say if the n-strongs are cofinal, there are unbottomly many n-strongs, and you have an embedding like this, N A and the N strongs below gamma are exactly the points in it. That is the embedding is preserving it's preserving um, N strength up to a level. So you're not just preserving the bounded subset of gamma, you're also preserving this predicate up to gamma. All right. Um, see, what I really want is the relativized version. Alpha is n strong in beta, or n plus one strong in beta. If the, this is inductive, if the n strongs in beta are cofinal in beta, and blah, blah, blah. And um, you know, V beta thinks that alpha is n plus one strong. So you can kind of localize the definition. Oh, I should say so. Zero strong and beta just means that they're both best numbers. Okay, so one strong means that in beta means that beta is a limit of Beth numbers, so it's a strong limit. And alpha is strong in beta in the sense of these embeddings. Okay, so theorem two prime. This explains theorem two. I'm claiming that Mighty Mouse, oh, what is Mighty Mouse? I didn't tell you. So. MM, this is not Martin's maximum today. <laughs> this is Mighty Mouse. Is the least mouse with a measurable cardinal, kappa, which is a limit of n strongs, right, of cardinals which are n strong in kappa. In kappa, for each n. It's just the same kappa that's a limit of n strongs for every n. It's not different kappas. Their n's, I mean, the sets of n strongs are different because they thin out. Yeah, they thin out. For each, n, for each n, it's a limit. It's a limit of n-strongs. It's not that the cardinals are n-strong It's a limit of cardinals which are n-strong. It's, it's a limit of cardinals, each of which is n-strong for every n, or for each No, n, no, oh, no, I'm cardinal. sorry. For each n, yes. that should come first. It's the least mass of the measurable cardinal kappa, such that for each n, it's a limit of n-strongs. A, a, a little bit ambiguous what I wrote, but that's what I meant to say. Okay, now um, you can talk to inner model theorists. Uh, I think, I mean, one strong that is strong, this is something that Jensen and Dodd and many people looked at for a long time. This is where you have models with extenders that don't overlap each other, so to say. Because when you iterate, the iterations are linear. You just is keep it, hitting the same. Oh, it's below a wooden <laughs> by by Lewenheim Skolem, right? Because yeah. Um, it's easy to derive this from kappa being definably wooden. 
that is wooden for definable predicates. Oh, I see. So if you have a wooden, that's wooden for all predicates. So this is trumped by being wooden for definable predicates. So it's yeah, way so it's below. Yeah. 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 I mean, these are first order. I mean, as n goes up, the definition gets more complicated. Oh, but it's but for each n, it's a first order predicate. Yeah. So essentially, I mean, if you have woodenness relative to definable predicates. Oh. That's enough to produce this. So these are pretty low in the hierarchy. And I'm not saying the iterations are linear. You need iteration trees, but um, the iterability conditions are not complicated. They're only pi 1, 2. Can you get this strange stability of the end strong by, I mean, by starting with something seemingly, seemingly weaker and then iterating and arriving with something like this? Let's see how. I mean, generally, if you say the least mouse with a certain amount of strength, that is, you know, that's not going to be an iterative anything. I mean, this thing can't be an iterative anything. This is what's called a sound projectable mouse. It's, it's like a core mouse. Uh, you can iterate it up, but it's not going to be the iterative anything. Anyway, I guess I'm not going to take the time of saying this too precisely, but the idea is that Mighty Mouse as an iterate where, and this is extremely sloppy, so I'll put it in quotes, um, n strong, I mean, alpha is n strong and beta, oh, this is obviously false, but I'll say it anyway, <laughs> if and only if alpha is n stable. Is that what I called it, n stable? Yeah, n stable. In other words, now the idea is you want to iterate this thing so that the strength relationships land on the stability relationships. Right before we wanted to move the measurables onto cardinals. But now it's not a unary predicate, it's a binary predicate we want, or ternary if you include that. We have this relationship, stability relationships between the pairs. So the idea is to make this stability relationship captured by this strength relationship. So that's, what, that's what's going on. So it requires iteration trees, but you can, again, perform your iteration so that um, this will happen. Now, this is not literally correct because, after all, a limit of stables is stable, and a limit of strongs could be singular. So on the left, I should say alpha is either n strong or a limit of n strongs. You know, n strong or a limit of such. <laughs> Or limit of such. That's the correct version. If and only if alpha is n stable in beta. Okay. So in this sense, you can capture the stability predicate using these degrees of strength. So that's why we can love and admire Mighty Mouse, because she has the tools available to, um, she has enough information internally that she can be iterated so that that information, that is the strength pattern, can be iterated up to reflect the stability patterns in V. And that means then that the stable core is captured by iterating Mighty Mouse. Now, uh, there are lots of open questions here. I was thinking today, I conjecture but can't prove <laughs> that Mighty Mouse is the least mouse <laughs> that will do this in general. That is, if you have something where for some n, the n strongs are not unbounded in the top measurable, then there will be situations where you cannot capture the stable core with such a mouse. I don't know how to do that. But it really feels right to me. It feels that this is the optimal strength you need to capture stability, is with this relative notion of strength. Um, and then I guess the next move is to start looking more carefully as to what is this generic extension and what is this iteration really doing. 
hoping to gain more information about V. At least you have the corollary that we now know that V is a generic extension of a fine structural model. Right, it's a generic extension of this iterate of, um, of uh, Mighty Mouse. So that's some progress, if you like, on the intermodel question, which is can you find an intermodel of V with uh, a nice internal structure? It's a little bit confusing because you would expect that that intermodel, if it's going to really reflect V well, should have much larger cardinals, like wooden cardinals. But nevertheless, what's happening here is you iterate up to a model which contains the stability predicate definably, which has no wooden cardinals, and you force and you produce supercompacts. So that says something about forcing. Forcing can produce large cardinals that you never anticipated in the ground model. It's not, not that the ground model accidentally you know, killed supercompact. The ground model never even had an idea of what a supercompact cardinal was because it's just an iterate of, of Mighty Mouse. And Mighty Mouse you know, has no hint of a wooden cardinal in it, but somehow it's iterated and now you force a supercompact cardinal. I don't know. Is this is set theory inconsistent? It could be. <laughs> but there's no immediate inconsistency that I found here. Nevertheless, it's... Uh, Oh, yeah. You say the iteration, uh, no, like, the large part of the Yes, but then you end up with this iterate, which looks very much like Mighty Mouse. From the first, from the first Internally. Point, first order theory is the same. It's also class forcing, right? That you but then the class forcing kind of gives birth to super compact cardinals in the extension. Uh, over a ground model that has no idea what a wooden cardinal is. So, I don't know. Yair, do you know a solution to this paradox? You, this didn't seem to bother you when we spoke about it. <laughs> I guess it says something maybe about forcing. The notion of forcing in the abstract is unfortunately just absolutely wild. It's just that when you work with forcing, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know what the force it is, and so you can understand how the generic extension relates to the ground model. But um, in this case, you have no idea. Okay, I've run out of things to say. Thank you very much, and uh, it's time for a party. <laughs>